This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, um, so yesterday we um, um, talked about uh, the cloning paradox, and that's where we stopped. So we argued that uh, if you throw a qubit into a black hole, and if we have unitary evaporation, this qubit will have to be encoded in the outgoing radiation. And then we have uh, the same quantum information in two places uh, at the same time on this nice slice. And this is inconsistent with linearity in quantum mechanics. But then we discussed the possibility of avoiding this problem by postulating the idea of black hole complementarity, which is um, the statement that there is no single observer who can simultaneously access P and Q. So uh, if no, no observer is able to detect cloning, then perhaps uh, we do not need to worry about this paradox. Now, there have been some refinements uh, that I will present now, uh, which um, make this problem, um, we, which uh, challenge the idea of complementarity. And one of them is based on uh, an observation about the properties of quantum entanglement of fields near the horizon. And uh, so this is called the strong subadditivity paradox. And uh, it was first formulated by uh, Samir Matur in 2009. And then it was elaborated by and expanded by uh, Amps, uh, who called it uh, the firewall paradox. So let me briefly explain the paradox. Um, so yesterday, we, uh, uh, we discussed the uh, entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation as a function of the number of particles. And we found that according to the computation of Hawking, the entanglement entropy keeps increasing forever. And at the end of the evaporation, we have a mixed state. While uh, according to unitary evaporation, we expect that uh, the curve will have this form. So, uh, in order for this uh, to be true, what it means is that the particles which are emitted after the half point of the evaporation have to be entangled not with a remaining black hole, but rather with the Hawking radiation which was emitted in the past. So uh, let's draw the black hole here, and we have the radiation which was emitted a long time ago. Let's call it A. So this, these are the, so uh, yeah. So this is the Hawking radiation which was emitted in the past, and we consider a new pair of, of Hawking particles produced near the horizon. One of them we call B. It's the outgoing particle, and its partner is called C the incoming particle, and uh, what I was trying to say is that if we're half the, uh, after half, uh, the point of half of the evaporation of the black hole, this particle B will have to be entangled with A in order for the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation to be decreased. If this B was entangled with uh, the black hole, then when this particle B joins the remaining Hawking particles, the entanglement entropy of this radiation would increase. Instead, we want to go down which means that this particle has to be entangled with the early Hawking radiation. So for this part of the diagram, and for unitarity, we need that B is entangled with A. Let me also draw the Penrose diagram to make clear what I'm talking about. Uh, so, so this the, the, the Hawking particles which were emitted in the past uh, is what we call A, and we're considering a new pair of Hawking particles B and C. And uh, what we're trying to argue is that when this guy B travels all the way to infinity and joins the, the, the previous particles, the entanglement entropy of this set of particles has to decrease because we are on this part of the, of the curve. We have assumed that the, the evaporation is unitary, so the entanglement entropy has to decrease. So uh, if we want to uh, quantify it a little bit more, we can say that if we consider the entanglement entropy of A together with the particle B, it has to be less than the entanglement entropy of A alone. And this has to be true after uh, the half point of evaporation. So this is what we need for unitarity, right? Yeah. 
Is this point clear? Are there any questions? You say it should be true only after half point, but should it be not somehow true from the very beginning on? Since the curve is always lower than the true of the original Well, uh, this notation means that uh, you take A to be a particular point, let's say this point, and then you add one more particle. So this is point A, and this is point A together with a new particle B. So if, we're, if you're on this part of the curve, SAB is greater than SA. If you are on that part of the diagram, this is A, and now we're adding one more particle and we move uh, there, so this is A together with B. Now the entanglement entropy has to decrease. Thank you. Another yeah. question, basically the same as yesterday. <coughs> there are these uh, soft gravitons, which were all yeah. in the papers by Perry, Stormy, and Hawking, and so on. Um, are they included somehow in your consideration or...? Yeah, I mean, if, if they exist, they definitely have to be included in order for the final state to be pure, because uh, you would expect that these particles will be entangled with uh, normal Hawking particles. Mm -hmm. So if you want to check unitarity, you have to uh, consider all particles which are produced by the black hole. So we would have to include them, yes. I, I think that in that paper they mostly talked about the entropy of the they black hole, if I'm not uh, mistaken. They give argument that the whole entropy, so to speak, can be um, encoded in these soft modes, right? Uh, yes. Um, though I'm not sure if they make any statement about uh, the information paradox. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, after the pace time, we expect that this, uh, uh, this particle B has to be entangled with the uh, early radiation A. It's important uh, to, uh, to, uh, to notice that we're, we're not saying that uh, a given, this particle B will be uh, entangled with uh, one particle in the whole radiation. So the entanglement is not in pairs of particles. This particle B is entangled with the entirety of the early Hawking radiation. So if you take only two, if you take this particle B and the particular uh, particle in the Hawking radiation, and you compute the mutual information between these two, it's going to be exponentially small. So uh, this particle is not significantly entangled with any particular particle of the radiation, but rather it is entangled with uh, this entire system. As I said before, you can, uh, you can check this uh, by using a toy model, for example, this, a spin chain that we discussed yesterday, where uh, you can check all these properties explicitly if you want. Now the problem is that uh, we, need, we, we, have this, we need this entanglement between B and A in order to uh, restore unitarity, but uh, at the same time we need entanglement between B and C uh, if we want the horizon to be smooth. Um, so, so for uh, the smoothness of horizon, We need that B is entangled with A, sorry, with C. So this we, uh, uh, I mean, I think uh, yesterday um, Raphael and uh, Larus discussed this in the context of Rindler space. So if you take flat space and you divide it in two parts uh, and you take them in Kolsky vacuum, which is the ground state of the quantum field, uh, you find that the modes on the two sides of uh, space, if you divide space by introducing these uh, real horizons, and you consider the, the Minkowski uh, state and you expand it in a basis of modes corresponding to the right and the left waves, you find that the Minkowski vacuum is an entangled state. And in particular, uh, if you concentrate on a, f on a mode of given frequency, you find that the entanglement is of the form, sum over the occupation levels of the mode, e to the minus pi omega uh, n, left and right. And of course, we have to uh, take the product over all modes. There's an infinite number of those, so you have to be careful about that. But um, the point is that the Minkowski vacuum is a highly entangled state between the right and the left. Now, this entanglement is actually necessary in order for this horizon to be smooth. What do I mean by that? Uh, this state, uh, is the unique state in the quantum field theory with a property that the stress tensor, T mu nu, is equal to zero everywhere. So there's no, uh, ex no excitations anywhere in the quantum field. So an observer who is crossing this horizon will not notice anything. 
if you modify the quantum state by modifying this entanglement, generally you will uh, introduce energy into the system. So T mu is not going to be zero anymore. So if we modify the entanglement, so if we reduce or modify the entanglement, between uh, the two wedges, then we generate uh, excitations. So we're no longer in the ground state. That's pretty obvious, right? This is a unique state. If the ground state is unique. If you change the state, you will have a state with excitations. But you can also check it explicitly in a free field by uh, writing down some modification of this entanglement and calculating the stress tensor on the new state. And you can, from that you can uh, compute what will be the distribution of energy on, on space-time. So an extreme possibility would be to consider a quantum state where uh, we demand that uh, uh, the field looks like the vacuum on the right, it looks like the vacuum on the left, but there's no entanglement at all between the left and the, left and the right. How do we do that? Well, if we take the Minkowski vacuum, and if we trace out the left part, we generate uh, the reduced density matrix for the uh, right wedge. So we start with the Minkowski vacuum, and we trace out the left part. And this generates the density matrix for the right wedge, which, as uh, you know, is a thermal density matrix uh, with respect to uh, the Hamiltonian, which corresponds to the boost. And this is the, the, the Unruh effect, right? The same is true for the left wedge. So now suppose that we take a density matrix of the total system, which is the tensor product of the left and the right. So there's no entanglement now between the two wedges, but each one of them, locally, for experiments that you do only inside the wedge, it looks exactly like the vacuum. Then we would be in a situation where uh, the space-time looks like the vacuum here, it looks like the vacuum there, but there's no entanglement between the two wedges. And if you take that state and if you calculate the stress energy tensor, the expectation value of T mu, you will find that it's zero everywhere inside these two wedges, but it blows up once you try to cross this horizon. So uh, this shows that uh, whenever we have space-time and we cut it uh, in some uh, region into two parts, if we want the space-time to be smooth in that region, then we need to have entanglement between the two sides. Now, uh, this calculation can be done easily in the black hole in, the, in, in a flat space, but you can do a similar calculation locally near the horizon of a black hole, and the qualitative conclusion is the same, that you need to have entanglement between the modes of the quantum field on the two sides, if you want that an infalling observer does not detect any excitations on the horizon. So, uh, so what this means is that uh, when we consider the black hole evaporation and we have a new pair of Hawking particles produced near the horizon, uh, then if we want the horizon to be smooth, we need these two guys to be highly entangled. So here we have uh, a problem because we have found, we have um, uh, two different conditions about this particle B, uh, that B has to be entangled with C, its Hawking pair, inside the black hole, and at the same time B has to be entangled with um, the early Hawking radiation, and this violates a uh, property of uh, quantum entanglement, which is called monogamy, so this violates the monogamy of quantum entanglement. So uh, the relevant uh, system is uh, the particle B. Now we can make this a bit more precise by um, using a, a property of um, entanglement entropy which is called strong subadditivity. So let me write it here. Uh -huh. The black hole situation seems to me at least a little bit different from the Rindler situation. Uh -huh. Rindler you entangle between the left and the right wedge. Yeah. And oh, yeah, yeah. Not, not across the Sorry, I did not explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You entangle across the horizon. Yeah, uh, I did not. Uh, I should have explained a bit more. So, um, 
so again, let's look at Rindler space. Uh, when an observer crosses the Rindler horizon, what is relevant for this observer is the entanglement between the modes that are on this side of the horizon and the modes that are on this side of the horizon, as you say, right? That's, that's, that's the, 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 the entanglement that this guy will, will measure. But these modes, if you trace them back, they're coming from the left wedge. So if you want these guys to be entangled in this region, they should have been entangled already uh, when they were here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In, in, in this case, the right wedge and the left wedge. Um, basically, if you if you have access to the right and the left, you can reconstruct the future and the past. Right? They're not independent. Um, they don't, do not correspond to independent factors of the Hilbert space. Any point here can be fully reconstructed by the left and the right ways. Okay, so um, let me now uh, go to the strong subadditivity. So the strong subadditivity uh, property of entanglement entropy uh, is a statement that if we have three uh, independent uh, systems, so we have th a, B, and C as independent quantum systems by which I mean that the Hilbert space can be factorized as a tensor product of the three Hilbert spaces. Then uh, the entanglement entropy of, uh, I mean, you can consider uh, the reduced density matrix in all possible combinations here. You can take A together with B, A together with C, and so on and so forth. And then the entanglement entropy has to obey this inequality. All right, let's apply this uh, theorem to the situation that we have uh, during black hole evaporation, where A, B, and C is what I have indicated uh, over there. So, um, as we uh, explained, uh, if we want the horizon to be smooth, then B has to be highly entangled with C. And in particular, if you take B together with C, they have to be in a pure state. How do we see that? We can see that in, 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 uh, in Rindler space, where we wrote down the expansion. And you notice that uh, we have the left and the right modes. But if you take this you know, a left mode and its partner on the right together, they are in a pure state. So these guys, if you take them together, they're in a pure state. So S, B, C is equal to zero. However, uh, we know that S of B is order one, is non zero, because the particle B is a particle which is thermally populated, right? So together, these two guys are in a pure state, but B alone is in a thermal state, which means that C will also be in a thermal state. Since B and C together are in a pure state, the entanglement entropy of B will be equal to the entanglement entropy of C, right? So we know that this is of order one. For one particle, this is uh, zero. And then this inequality is telling us that SAB has to be greater than SA. Which means that it contradicts what we need in order to restore unitarity. So this is telling us that the entanglement entropy will have to keep increasing forever as we add more and more particles to the uh, Hawking radiation. Right? All right. Now, uh, of course, you can have some objections here. You can say that uh, maybe this, um, uh, these statements are not exact. Maybe uh, there are some small corrections. So maybe this entanglement is not exactly zero, uh, and perhaps these small corrections can fix the problem. But uh, uh, Samir uh, Matur has uh, um, proved the theorem that small corrections cannot fix this problem.
So I guess he will review it uh, in one of his lectures later this week. Um, but let me say that uh, that theorem uh, relies on certain assumptions uh, about uh, locality, uh, which I'm going to uh, address later. Uh, so what I want to say is that uh, if you relax some of the assumptions of this theorem, uh, it may be possible to avoid it, I think. Uh, if you have a system, so, uh, is this clear, first of all? You are, you are assuming that they are in a product state. They are in a, together they are in a pure state. It's not a product state, it's together B and C are in a pure state. That's what we get, for example, in Minkowski space. Um, SBC means you are, you are traced uh, out a. part A. Exactly. And I'm saying that if you trace out A, yeah. uh, you find a pure state on the subsystem B together with C. Good, so this means that B and C are in a pure state. So if you have a system, a quantum system, which has two parts, B and C, and if you know that the full system is in a pure state, then it's a theorem that the entanglement entropy of this guy is equal to the entanglement entropy of that guy. Okay, so yeah. you are now just talking about B and C, not A. Yes, and I'm doing that because, uh, I can do that because by this assumption, I, I, I have concluded that uh, B and C together are in a pure state, so I don't need to worry about A. I could have A here, but I, I'm not going to use it for anything. But you don't know about B and how B is entangled with A and C is entangled with A. This is what I'm... Uh, no, I'm saying from the computation of Hawking, from the computation of Hawking, I get this result, which is telling me that B is not entangled with A and C is not entangled with A. Instead, B is entangled with C. That's what, that's what Hawking's computation is telling us. But this is in contradiction with what we needs in order to restore unitarity. Okay, uh, so uh, we have this paradox and then the question is uh, I, how are we going to avoid it? Are we going to, um, to give up uh, one of the two entanglements, the one that we need there or here? So of course if, if you assume that uh, the there is no entanglement bet between B and A then you lose unitarity and uh, we're not going to talk about that possibility. Uh, the other possibility is that, uh, for some reason, uh, this is not correct. So there's no entanglement between B and C. But as I explained a little bit earlier, uh, if you do not have the entanglement between B and C, then you will generate particles on the horizon. These will be physical particles that the infalling observer will be able to detect. And the problem is that uh, if you do that, if you, do the, if you run the same argument for all modes of the quantum field, not just one of them, but all of them, then you will generate a huge number of particles on the horizon and uh, it will have uh, this uh, very large number of particles, will generate a very large stress energy tensor on the horizon, which will back react and it will completely modify the geometry. So, so if we give up BC entanglement, then we generate uh, energy on the horizon particles. And uh, this may lead to a modification of the geometry and uh, um, to, um, yeah, it, it may lead to something like a firewall. So um, a region of very high energy density near the, the, the horizon which will modify the geometry and perhaps there's no interior. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, I was planning to mention it, but uh, uh, another possibility that uh, Steve has uh, discussed uh, is that uh, it could be that uh, uh, when this particle B is, is produced near the horizon, it is entangled with C, but then as it travels out towards uh, the early radiation A, uh, then at some point the entanglement between B and C is broken by some non-local effects. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think it's a picture. Yeah. Sense in which that's when, when the Hawking modes become real. 
Yeah, yeah. So I should have emphasized that this is a sharp, sharp paradox if we insist on having exact locality or um, if that we do not have any non-local effects in the exterior of the black hole. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think that uh, when I talk about the ADS version of the paradox, I will probably uh, come to your point, which is that we can uh, try to, if, if we try to find the operators which represent the region, the, the modes near the horizon, we will run into uh, paradoxes which are not exactly this one, but quite similar. So it, for a big black hole in ADS, there is no evaporation, but uh, as we will discuss later, uh, there is a, a, a problem in reconstructing these modes B and C from the, from the boundary. Okay, so uh, if we uh, give up this entanglement, then we have this uh, dramatic uh, prediction that uh, the black hole horizon is, uh, has to be modified. And uh, let me emphasize that uh, this, this, is a, this is a big effect over macroscopic scales because uh, it would apply to a black hole of arbitrary size. So in particular, it would be relevant for a black hole of a very large mass where the curvature uh, at the horizon can be, can be quite small. So this would be a modification of GR uh, in a regime where we wouldn't expect this. Okay. Um, so before I, I move on to ADS-CFT, let me mention one, one more um, uh, aspect of this paradox, which is that, um, well, yesterday we discussed about uh, the idea of complementarity, black hole complementarity, which is that uh, perhaps the quantum state on the nice slice does not make sense. And that's why we said maybe we don't need to worry about cloning. So you could have asked the same question here. If uh, the quantum state on the nice slice does not make sense, then why do you try to apply the strong subadditivity inequality uh, on, uh, on that slice, right? Because that's what we're doing. We're considering, we're considering uh, this nice slice and uh, we're saying there are three quantum systems, A, B, and C, and we're applying the strong subadditivity theorem to them. Uh, but according to the, post to the principle of black hole complementarity, we should not be doing that because maybe there's no uh, well-defined quantum state on the slice, right? However, uh, so, and, and again, the logic is that there is no observer who can actually measure or detect the, the violation of strong subjectivity, right? That would be an argument. Who can detect this violation? Well, actually, uh, it is possible to detect it, and that's what was pointed out by, by AMPS. And, um, and I guess Raphael uh, maybe uh, explained in more detail uh, this point. In the, in the original paper, um, yeah, it was actually also in the original paper to some extent. So the idea is the following. Um, we consider uh, the black hole evaporation after uh, the pace time. And this particle B, according uh, to, um, if we want to have unitary, unitary evaporation, this particle B has to be highly entangled with uh, the early radiation. What this means is that you can identify in this Hawking radiation a, a tensor factor, let me call it B tilde, which is maximally entangled with this qubit B, with this mode B. So this B tilde rep represents a scrambled uh, mode which is encoded in the entirety of the Hawking radiation and it is what purifies the mode B. So these two guys are maximally entangled. At the same time, for uh, the smoothness of the horizon, we want uh, B to be maximally entangled with C. So what you can check is that it is possible for an observer to um, go through the Hawking radiation, extract the scrambled qubit B tilde, and then dive into the black hole where this observer will encounter both B and C. 
So this observer is holding the tilde, and uh, he's carrying the tilde uh, with him as he falls into the black hole, and then detects B and C. So there is a single observer who can detect all these three particles at once, and if we assume that we have maximal entanglement between both B and B tilde and between B and C, this observer will detect a violation of monogamy of entanglement. So there is some uh, experiment, thought experiment that you can do in principle, which uh, will be able to uh, detect this paradox. Of course, there are some interesting discussions whether uh, it is extracting this qubit is extremely difficult. So uh, w an interesting question is whether uh, there is enough time for this guy to go through this Hawking radiation and extract the, the qubits and then zap it to the black hole. Uh, so there have been some interesting discussions about that, but uh, I'm not going to go there now. Okay. So that's all I want to say about the paradox in flat space. Um, there's a question. No, it's a tensor factor. I mean, A is a very big Hilbert space. It's a very large Hilbert space, right? Right, but, but, but can you really sum, I thought you said that for any given part of it, you're like to, to really completely purify it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I mean is um, you can take this big Hilbert space A and select a basis in a clever way so that you get B tilde as a small tensor factor of the Hilbert space and the rest, and then B will be entangled with B tilde, right? But of course, to do that, it, it's extremely difficult, and in particular, the result will depend on the particular black hole that you that you consider. I'm not saying there's a fixed tensor factor of A which is always entangled with B. Yeah. Where from the argument you see that the particles in the horizon are high energy? Well, I said that uh, if you break this entanglement for a large number of particles, I mean, we we run this argument for one mode now, right? But we have. Well, you can you can just do the calculation by taking flat. I mean, you can do the calculation locally, right? In flat, so you can use flat space as a uh, as a toy model, right? And take this uh, the states there, and um, break the entanglement for like a very large number of modes and compute the stress tensor. If you do that, you find that it has very high energy. Uh, before I go on, let me mention a technical point here, that uh, if we want to have a smooth horizon, it's not only necessary to have entanglement between the two sides, but we also need uh, to have a, the specific form of entanglement that I wrote down. That's why I, 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 I wrote here that if we reduce or modify the entanglement, then we generate excitations, right? What I mean by that is that if you take this, the Mikowski vacuum in flat space and you modify the details of the entanglement, for instance, if you introduce a phase here, which depends on the occupation level n, if you do that, the entanglement entropy does not change. So this new state is as entangled as the previous state, but the details or the phase of the entanglement are different. Now, if you compute the stress tensor on this state, you will find that it's not equal to zero. So you do generate excitations by changing the details of the entanglement. So uh, what I want to say is that it's not only that we need B and C to be entangled, they have to be entangled in a very specific way. Okay, any other questions about uh, the paradox in flat space before I move on to ADS uh, CFT? Okay. Now, um, now I don't know, uh, how many of you are uh, somewhat familiar with uh, ADS CFT correspondence? Um, okay, so I will assume that uh, uh, you, you have seen some introduction before, uh, but if you have questions that I can, uh, that, uh, well, I can try to answer them. But, uh, let, me, let me give a very brief uh, overview. So the idea that we have um, of ADSFT is that we have a conformal field theory um, living um, in D dimensions. So we have a CFT, uh, D dimensional CFT. Equivalent to uh, quantum gravity or string theory 
on ADS5, or ADS D plus one, times some internal manifold. <coughs> now, uh, if you have uh, a conformity theory, it's very natural to define it on a sphere. So we will be talking about the conformity theory defined on a sphere across time. So we'll take the conformity theory to be on a compact space. And uh, then uh, the dual geometry is ADS5, ADS D plus one. And here we draw a diagram where time runs up, goes up. This is the regular direction. And uh, for some purposes, it is useful to think of the CFT as living on the boundary, even though this is not completely accurate. And of course, the idea is that anything that happens uh, in the interior of ADS is encoded in, uh, in the CFT. More precisely, uh, in some sense, uh, S matrix elements in ADS are related to correlation functions in the CFT. So there's a mapping between uh, fields, operators in the, in the conformity theory, and fields in, in, in ADS. So this mapping is worked out. A any field that you give me in, in gravity, I know how to map it to, to the CFT. And uh, correlators of uh, this field O are related to, uh, in some sense, S matrix elements of this uh, field in the bulk. Now, if the, if the CFT is in, uh, in the ground state, then the dual geometry is uh, ADS5, uh, ADS. Uh, so, um, let me write down the metric. Uh, so, um, the basic idea is that, um, uh, so you can think of this space as a space where there's a confining gravitational potential. Uh, as you see, this uh, factor, this redshift factor grows as R goes to infinity. So the boundary of ADS is as uh, R goes to infinity. Uh, but there's an attractive potential which is pulling everything towards the center of ADS. And um, the claim now is that the Hilbert space of the theory in the bulk is equivalent to the Hilbert space of the theory on the boundary. So all these questions about black holes we can try to address uh, in the context of ADCFT. Now, um, let me make some more uh, precise statements. So uh, it is useful to um, think about a, a very basic example of ADCFT, which is the equivalence between um, the n equals four spray young mills it's a four-dimensional quantum field theory with gaze group SUN and um, type 2B string theory on ADS5 times S5. And um, so, uh, um, what I want to um, mention here is that uh, when we have this correspondence, there are a few parameters that we need to tune in order for uh, the bulk theory to be described by gravity, by classical gravity, semi-classical gravity, and not string theory. And uh, there are two of these parameters. One is n. We need to take n to be very large, because uh, in ADCFT, the radius of curvature of ADS uh, is given by um, n to the one quarter times the Planck length. So if we want the radius of curvature of ADS to be much bigger than the Planck length, we need to take n to infinity. And uh, also, the radius of ADS is related to the string scale by lambda to one quarter, where lambda is a Toft coupling. And uh, it is easier to work with uh, gravity rather than string theory, so we will be uh, working the limit where lambda is much bigger than one. So in this limit, uh, the uh, bulk side of the correspondence reduces to uh, supergravity on ADS5 times S5. And for all purposes of my talk, this internal sphere will not play any role. So from now on, I will just forget about it, and I will talk about string theory on ADS5. But if you want to make things precise, you have to restore all this, uh, the, the internal manifold. And you may have to take into account effects coming from string theory or, or uh, quantum gravity. OK. So um, we said that the Hilbert space of the two theories are equivalent. And in gravity, uh, we can consider uh, black holes in ADS. 
So uh, a black hole in ADS um, has a metric which is uh, very similar to this one. So here is some number times g m over r to the uh, d minus uh, two. Okay, so you can have black holes of many of any mass. You can change the mass of a black hole in ADS. And um, what I, uh, um, it, it, uh, I want to um, remind you that uh, in ADS there are um, two classes of black holes. Uh, there are black holes. Uh, so if the horizon uh, radius is um, of the order or larger than uh, the radius of ADS, this we call big black holes in ADS. Uh, and if the horizon of the black hole is much smaller than the radius of ADS, that's a small black hole. So small black holes in particular, just a second, small black holes in ADS will behave very similar to black holes in flat space because uh, the size of the horizon is much smaller than the cosmological scale. So uh, we can approximate uh, a black hole in flat space by considering a very small black hole in ADS. Yes? Um, sorry, what is my... Let, let's no, I think this is okay, right? Uh, the, yeah. So, in particular, uh, these small black holes, if they are sufficiently small, they evaporate and they also have negative specific heat. I mean, before they evaporate, they have negative specific heat and eventually they evaporate. Now, uh, these black holes we do not understand very well from the point of view of the CFT. So I'm not going to talk about those. I will concentrate on the big black hole in ADS. So a big black hole in ADS uh, has a property that it has positive specific heat. And it does not evaporate. So the idea is that if this big black hole in ADS emits hot radiation, but the radiation tries to climb up the, the potential, the gravitational potential of ADS. It can't make it all the way to the boundary, so it turns around and falls back into the black hole. And eventually, you reach a state of thermal equilibrium between the black hole and its hot radiation. So these big black holes are in thermal equilibrium with their own hot radiation. And I will focus the rest of my talk on this type of black hole. Okay. Uh, let me also uh, mention a few more technical uh, things that we will need later. Yeah, actually, before I move on to the, to the large black hole, let me mention a few things about the small black holes in ADS, the evaporating ones. So, uh, even though we don't fully understand how to describe them from the point of view of the quantum field theory, uh, as a matter of principle, uh, it is very useful to consider them because uh, uh, if you accept the ADS-FT uh, duality, then uh, it implies that the evaporation of these black holes has to be unitary. 
So uh, you can imagine a situation where you start with uh, ADS uh, in the ground state, then you send two particles from the boundary by exciting the conformal field theory by some operators. If these particles have very high energy, they can collide and form a small black hole in ADS, which will uh, stay there for a while, then it will evaporate, it will emit Hawking radiation, and after a very long time, it will completely evaporate. And this entire process can be described on the, on the conformal field theory in the boundary, which is a manifestly unitary theory. You have a Hermitian Hamiltonian, so the boundary will assure that there's no information lost. And then this process of black hole formation evaporation can be encoded in certain correlators in the CFT. Uh, it's very difficult to compute them in practice, but at least as a matter of principle, we know that this will correspond to a unitary evolution. So these small black holes in ADS uh, uh, evaporate uh, without uh, information loss. And in particular, uh, as you see uh, from the equation above, uh, we can make the size of ADS as big as we like. There's no upper limit. We can take N to be as, 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 big, as big as we want. So we can approximate a black hole in flat space to arbitrary accuracy by taking N to be large enough. So this very strongly suggests that even black holes in flat space uh, do not uh, destroy unitarity when they evaporate. Uh, no, I think uh, it depends on how we scale the, si the, the mass of the black hole. So I, I think there is a, a scaling where the black hole will evaporate, uh, uh, even though n uh, goes to infinity. It's the question of how you scale uh, the, um, the energy of the black hole at the same time, right? Let's take n to infinity. It's the same statement that you can approximate a flat space a quantum gravity as matrix by taking n to infinity, right? You just have to tune the energies of the collision in an n-dependent way, as you said, n to infinity. To, if you really want to approximate local uh, flat space physics in AD50. Yes? Just to raise same question. If n goes to infinity, the, the string coupling is zero, right? So there are basically no interactions anymore. Uh, it depends on the energy scale also, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, some, there's a Planck scale in the bulk, right? Yeah. It's some scale. It goes to infinity. The Planck scale goes to zero as a length in units of ADS, but I can always consider collisions whose energy is very high so that they probe that very small scale. Okay, so uh, small black holes uh, are, are, are useful uh, as a matter of principle. They settle the question of unitarity, but as I said before, it's very difficult to understand them from the point of view of the boundary. One way to see that is that these guys have negative specific heat. So it's not so easy to, uh, to come up with some uh, configuration of the boundary, which is an ordinary quantum field theory, which will have negative specific heat. Yeah. Um, yes, I think so, because um, as Lars explained earlier, the point with remnants is that you would, have, you would need to have uh, states with given energy and arbitrary, uh, arbitrary large entropy, right? So uh, the conformal field theories that we're talking about are standard, reasonable conformal field theories which do not have this property on the boundary, certainly not, right? So in that sense, this excludes uh, the, the scenario of remnants also. Now, these black holes, the small black holes, we don't yet know how to describe on the boundary. So now let's focus on a large black hole in ADS and try to see if we, come up, if we can come up with some version of the information paradox uh, uh, for these black holes. So at first, you may think that this is impossible because these black holes do not evaporate. So, uh, um, well, what would be the paradox then? However, there are some ways in which uh, we can come up with paradoxes which are similar to information loss. And as I will explain, and that I that's what I will emphasize, there is an analog of the firewall paradox for big black holes in ADS. So, a, a toy mo so let me start with uh, uh, just uh, talking ab about information loss for these black holes. So, a toy version of the information paradox for these black holes is the following. 
uh, we consider uh, throwing a particle uh, into, the black, into a big black hole in ADS, and we calculate uh, how quickly this particle is absorbed uh, by the black hole, right? So from the point of view of gravity, you can do that by computing a two-point function of a scalar field in the presence of a black hole. So you, you take the black hole state and you calculate uh, the two-point function of the scalar field in the presence of a black hole from the point of view of gravity. And what you find is that um, uh, the, the two-point function in the presence of the black hole decays exponentially because the, 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 the particle is being absorbed by the black hole. So this decays exponentially. And uh, the important point here is that it decays exponentially forever. The exponential decay never stops from the point of view of gravity. So it seems that the information of the little particle that you threw into the black hole disappears forever, right? However, uh, if you have a, a system with a finite number of states, you can prove that uh, a two-point function can never go to zero, but rather uh, a, a two-point function decays up uh, to a point where uh, its amplitude is of the order of e to the minus s, and then it fluctuates around that value for a very long time. So this is what you get from the point of view of gravity, but from quantum mechanics, if you do the same calculation in the quantum field theory, uh, you take uh, the same, uh, the, the operators dual to this mode on the boundary, and what you find is that uh, for early times, the CFT calculation reproduces what you get from gravity, so you find the exponential decay, but then at some point the exponential decay stops and uh, uh, you get, uh, uh, it saturates at the value which is of the order of e to the minus s, where s is the entropy of the black hole. And from that point on, the two-point function remains non-zero for a very, very, very long time. And if you wait exponentially long, you may have recurrences where uh, the signal goes back to its original value, decays again, and so on and so forth. So these effects, which are uh, a characteristic of a finite quantum system with a finite number of states, are not visible from the, from the point of view of gravity, where it seems that we lose information completely, right? So this is a toy version of the paradox. And, um, uh, but again, this, this aspect, this uh, form of the paradox uh, addresses what happens to the information from the point of view of an observer uh, sitting at infinity and throwing stuff into the black hole and then detecting properties of the radiation. So what I want to uh, focus on instead is what happens to uh, an observer who will try to probe the horizon of this black hole. So in the previous lectures, we emphasized that uh, one of the difficult aspects of the information paradox is to reconcile the smoothness of the horizon with uh, unitary evaporation. So this motivates us to consider the question of what happens to uh, the, the horizon of a big black hole in ADS. So we want to uh, study horizon and the interior First of all, um, let's see how we can form a, black, a big black hole in ADS. One way to do that is to uh, start with the CFT in the ground state, and then at some particular moment in time, you can excite the CFT by uh, turning on some sources in the, in the, the, in the boundary theory, which create uh, uh, some excitation which falls into the ADS, collapses into a black hole. So this represents stuff that you throw in from the boundary by exciting the CFT. And then you end up with a black hole uh, in ADS, a big black hole. So uh, whether the black hole is big or not depends on the amount of energy that you throw in. And uh, let me uh, also write down some numbers here. So these big black holes have the property that uh, their energy or their mass scales like n squared uh, in the larger limit times some function of the temperature. And their entropy also scales like n squared times some function of the temperature. But the temperature is uh, order one. So it's n to the power of zero times uh, one over R ADS. So in ADS-CFT, large black holes have the property that uh, their mass is very large, 
However, the temperature is not too high, right? Though this is not very difficult to understand uh, because uh, in ADSFT, a large black hole in ADS is supposed to be equivalent to a thermal state in the quantum field theory. As I already explained, uh, this quantum field theory is an SUN GS theory living on a sphere. So if we pretend for a moment that the theory is free, so we don't take any interaction into account, so we have a, a free theory living on a sphere, and we want to calculate the entropy of, of that theory at very, very high temperatures, or the energy. So uh, if it's a free theory, then uh, the energy at very high uh, temperature will be given by some constant times t to the fourth times the volume. Now, what is this constant? Well, obviously, this constant is proportional to the number of fields in the theory. We have an SUN gauge theory. The fields are adjoint valued. So each one of them has n squared degrees of freedom. So this constant is proportional to n squared. So if you take this theory on the boundary at temperature T, then the energy uh, will be proportional to n squared times t to the four times r cube. From, and this energy is going to be identified with the mass of the black hole in the bulk. That's why we get this formula. Similarly, you can also calculate the entropy and you find that it scales like n squared. Yeah. How is that temperature related to the ultimate temperature that you just get from the metric? It's the same. That grows for Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Um, the, yeah, uh, here I, I only want to indicate the scaling uh, with n. So here I have assumed that, uh, uh, so I should have written it in the following way. It's some, fun some smooth function, so these are different functions, f1, f2, f3, of the horizon of the black hole, where uh, I am uh, working in a limit where the horizon of the black hole uh, div divided by RADS uh, is some number which is n to the zero, right, as n goes to infinity. So I take the radius of the black hole to be fixed in units of the ADS scale, like two times the ADS scale, and then I take n to infinity. That's the limit, right? We fix the ratio of the horizon size to the ADS scale to be fixed, so it's some fixed constant. It's, it's fixed. And then we take n to infinity. Okay, so we want to uh, consider black holes which have mass of this order, so that you have to inject a lot of energy in the theory to produce a, a black hole of this type. And we want to know what happens in the region behind the horizon of this black hole. Right? We want to study whether the horizon here is smooth or not. Now, at first you may think that, of course, it's going to be smooth, because uh, why would it not be smooth? I mean, the only argument that we have against smoothness is the argument we outlined before based on uh, an evaporating black hole. So, and this argument was relevant for black holes after the page time. Here, this black hole does not evaporate. So at first you would think, for sure, this is going to be smooth. There's no reason to doubt it. But uh, as I will try to explain, there are some arguments which indicate that even uh, for a big black hole in ADS, uh, the horizon may not be smooth, and it's actually very non-trivial to understand how to describe the interior from the point of view of the CFT. Is it possible? Um, well, I think that, um, well, it's, not, uh, it's an open question. So I will describe some proposals uh, tomorrow, maybe, or today. And uh, well, we can discuss what, uh, what are the open questions. Yes? Uh, why is it now exactly true to a thermal state? Because it's dark by the I'm sorry, yes, you're right. I mean, I should have been a bit more careful here. Uh, when I said thermal state, uh, I meant uh, a typical pure state uh, of energy of disorder. So yesterday, I spent a lot of time trying to explain that um, a typical pure state looks very similar to a, to a, to a mixed state, right? So um, for, if you set it up in this way, then the state is going to be pure, of course, right? So this is not going to be a thermal state. But for the purpose of relating the mass to the uh, temperature, for instance, it's very useful to uh, approximate it by a thermal state. So let me uh, clarify it. Um, so a, a big black hole in ADS uh, can, I mean, there, there are various formulations. It can, it can be related to the thermal uh, uh, ensemble, which I will come to later. But uh, in most of my talk, I'll be thinking of it as a pure state. 
and in particular, it is a quark gluon plasma microstate. So this theory is an SQN gauge theory. Uh, we're working the limit where the coupling is very large. And there is some way in which you can think of excitations at low energies as, be, as corresponding to uh, confined bound states of the fields. But if you go to very high energies of this order, uh, the boundary theory undergoes a deconfinement phase transition into a phase uh, where the quarks and the, glu the, the gluons are, are liberated. So it's a, like a quark gluon plasma phase. And th this is like a gas of, of gluons. That gas can have many different microstates. Those microstates represent the microstates of black hole in ADS. So when you throw energy into the system, you form one of those microstates. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think it's, it's widely, widely believed that the N equals 4 spray mill is, is a strongly coupled and chaotic system at high energies. So it has an integrable sector at low energies when you study um, the planar spectrum of the theory at large N, but when you start forming black holes at these energies, it's believed that it's a chaotic system. So that there, I mean, it's not proven that it's integrable, so there's no reason to believe it's integrable. Some other sources. Yeah, you can do that, I guess. You can, um, uh, so, as I said before, this black hole is in equilibrium with its Hawking radiation. So, as we will explain a little bit, uh, if you look at, the, uh, uh, well, if you look at this Penrose diagram, and if you look at the quantum fields in this region, they are thermally populated. Now, uh, if you start, now, now this, these excitations cannot escape because the ADS uh, behaves like a confining box, right? So these particles cannot fly all the way to infinity. They come back, right? But if you turn on sources on the boundary, you can absorb them, and then uh, you can remove them. And uh, yeah, in that sense, you can force the black hole to evaporate. But this is going to be a very complicated thing to do, and uh, I'm not going to consider it uh, today. OK, so uh, we will proceed by uh, trying to understand how to describe the space time in this region outside the horizon from the point of view of the CFT. And then later, we'll try to see how to go behind the horizon and what we need in order to study local physics behind the horizon of a large black hole in ADS. So uh, we will start from the point of view of gravity to see what we need. And uh, we will uh, imagine a, a calculation similar to that of Hawking. So we'll consider this geometry and we, we will uh, take a scalar field on this background so we take a scalar field obeying the Klein-Gordon equation on this uh, in ADS. And we want to see what happens to this field uh, in the presence of a star which undergoes gravitational collapse. Now, uh, we assume that this field uh, is in the ground state uh, at early times. Then we throw in this shell of matter and we want to uh, compute the state of the quantum field at late times. So it's a, very, it's, it's a computation very similar to the one that Hawking did for a black hole in flat space, right? Now, if you consider the geometry at very late times, after the black hole has settled down and equilibrated, you can, uh, I mean, uh, we know that the geometry in this region is given by the, uh, the usual uh, ADS Schwarzschild metric. So we can, if we want to know uh, how to describe the field at late times, we can expand it in a basis of modes that you calculate using that metric. So uh, if you do that, you find that the field phi can be written as, uh, in the following way. So it's just an ordinary free field uh, propagating on a curved background. And uh, we have a, a killing isometry at late times. The state is approximately time translation invariant. So it's convenient to expand the field in modes with definite frequency. And then we have some spherical harmonic around the black hole. And then we have a, the regular wave function that you can calculate by solving the Klein-Gordon equation on that geometry. Right? So the solution will depend on omega L and M. 
And then we have these objects that will play the role of uh, creation and annihilation operators. And um, uh, to save time, I, I will not write down all these indices, omega, L, and M. Uh, if we need them, I will introduce them again, but uh, I will just write down B, right? So because the field is free, these guys will obey the canonical computation relations. Uh, however, you can compute uh, what is the quantum state of the field at late times, and what you find is that these modes are uh, thermally populated. So in particular, you find that uh, P dagger B is 1 over e to the beta omega minus 1, where now again beta is uh, 1 over t, and this is the temperature of the black hole. Now the relationship between the temperature and the mass is not the same as before. It's not that t is 1 over 8 pi gm, but it's not difficult to calculate the relationship between t and m for a black hole in ADS. So uh, what we find is that at late times we have these modes outside the horizon which are uh, thermally populated, and they seem to be in equilibrium because they cannot escape. They, can, they, they cannot fly all the way to infinity. So you can think of them as uh, standing waves uh, outside the black hole and thermal equilibrium with the, with the black hole. Yeah. Sorry, are you scaling the horizon size or, or the mass? Uh, horizon size. Yes, then this will go to inf the temperature will go to infinity. Uh, I, I have to think about it. I'm not sure. Um, so the question is, which modes are going to be, be uh, excited? Is it sort of modes that are visible to fiducial observers, or is it, is it modes that are visible? So these are the modes that are relevant for a static observer, right? More natural for a static observer. Because, uh, yeah, well, the, the way they depend on the right? Yeah, yeah. This, these are mo well. Yeah, these are modes which would be, would be relevant for an observer who is staying at a fixed value of r and uh, moving along t. So, it, yeah. So I, I would have to think a little bit about the back reaction. So maybe we can discuss it later. Uh, for the rest of uh, my talk, I will not take this limit. I will always assume that the size of the horizon divided by r ads is not scaled in any particular way. So we take this to be order one and fixed. Okay, so uh, these modes outside the horizon are thermally populated, and this is what sometimes is called the thermal atmosphere uh, uh, outside the horizon of a black hole. And now we'll try to understand this from the point of view of the CFT. So in the CFT, this field phi will be dual to some operator O, and um, I will now write down some uh, properties of this operator O on the boundary. So this field phi is equivalent to an operator O in the CFT. Uh, if you're not familiar with a um, dictionary of ADCFT, let me just write down one equation only. In some sense, you can think of this. This is not precise what I'm going to say, but for some intuitive reasons, it may be useful. If you take the limit of uh, r to the delta times phi uh, r so t r omega, so if you take the bulk field and you take the limit when r goes to infinity, uh, you expect it to be equal uh, to the operator, the dual operator at that point. So, uh, okay, there's some way we can map the fields in the bulk to the operators on the boundary. And what we're going to do now is we'll try to uh, identify what is the meaning of this mode B from the point of view of the CFT. So uh, here we assume that we form a black hole by the gravitational collapse of, of an object. So the black hole uh, corresponds to some uh, microstate psi. And we will be interested in correlators of this uh, field operator O on the state psi. So yesterday, um, 
we explain that if uh, we take this state psi to be a typical state, so if we assume that after after the black hole forms, and if we wait for a certain amount of time, this uh, state is, like, let's say, uh, is typical. Then uh, we uh, explained yesterday that if you calculate correlators of some operator on the same psi, they're going to be close to the correlators in the maximally mixed state. Now it's convenient to um, approximate these guys, not by the maximally mixed state, which is a microcanonical ensemble, but instead uh, we will approximate them by the thermal ensemble. And we're doing this for technical reasons. So yesterday, in the equation I wrote, I had the term here which was exponentially small because I was comparing a typical pure state to the microcanonical ensemble. Now I'm comparing to the canonical ensemble, so the, the error term is bigger. So it's of the order of 1 over s. But s is a huge number, so uh, we don't need to worry about that. I mean, most of the statements I'm going to make are, uh, are relevant in the larger limit and the entropy of this black hole is proportional to n squared, so these corrections become really tiny in the larger limit. So this is one property that the boundary correlators of this operator O satisfy. They can be, even though we're in a pure state, they can be approximated by thermal correlators. The second property that they obey is what is called large n factorization. Which means that if you look at, a, a, let's say, um, a higher point function between these O's on the state psi, you can factorize it in products of two-point functions. So it, it factorizes products of two-point functions. where the two-point functions are of the form, the same state psi, O, O, psi. And uh, this is a statement which is true at large, large n, so there are corrections which go like 1 over n here. Yeah? Uh, how important is it going to be for you that, that you're in a thermal state? So you're putting an expectation value in a thermal state. Yeah. Oh, you mean you want to consider some non-equilibrium state where there's stuff far away from the black hole which will eventually decay, but for a while they're just sitting there? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's of course a good question, but uh, it's, it's more difficult. So uh, I, I will come to this question, uh, well, maybe at the end of my lectures when I talk about non-equilibrium states. So I, I will start with a situation where we uh, just let the black hole settle down and uh, we assume it's, it can be well approximated by the thermal ensemble. I mean, you can prove that this is the majority of states, right? So the state you were talking about is atypical. No. Uh, it's, it, those are two different things. Typical or majority of states. So the kind of state that I have in mind would have enormously higher energy than this state. Yeah, so what I mean is that if you look at it's all... It's typical for that energy. Exactly. But so what? So, I mean, the reason why it's important to consider these states is that one of the key difficulties with the power of the problem right, is the, the fact that in asymptotically flat space, radiation can run into other larger systems and then when one wants to reconstruct the interior, mm -hmm. one has to access those larger systems. And um, to the extent that anything we can learn from the analysis in ADS-CFT is, is really relevant to the problem, I think it's very important to be able to mock that kind of situation up. Uh, well, uh, yeah, but I'm, so, I'm not sure I agree that the, the only reason we study these black holes in ADS uh, is in order to address the firewall paradox of flat space. There, there are other reasons that we want to study them, right? For example, if you want to study the singularity of a black hole in ADS, this is not, yeah. I just I mean, to the extent that we're yeah. to yeah, I think, I, I mean, if I have time, I will, uh, I will uh, mention these uh, subtleties that uh, you pointed out uh, a little bit later. Yeah. So this property of large n factorization is, is not trivial, right? Uh, I mean, you are probably familiar with the property of large n factorization in the ground state. But this is not the ground state. This is a state uh, which has energy of order n squared. So uh, the fact that this correlator factorize is not entirely trivial, and if you're interested, we can discuss some subtleties, uh, and we know situation where this breaks down. Uh, but uh, for now, let's um, assume that it's true, and uh, what we uh, get is that the higher point function of this guy's O on the state psi can be computed once you know the two-point function of, of O on the state psi. So this two-point function is not the ground state two-point function. It's the two-point function of the, of the field on the heavy state psi. 
In particular, we don't know how to calculate this in general. It's very difficult. Now, uh, you can simplify it a little bit by using this approximation, right? So this two-point function on the same psi uh, at large n can be uh, approximated by the thermal two-point function. So this is approximately equal to trace of it the minus beta h over z uh, o o. But even this guy is too difficult, right? Uh, it's a thermal two-point function of a strongly interacting quantum field theory at finite temperature. So uh, to be more precise, you can think of it. Uh, we, let me introduce also uh, the co coordinates. So we would like to be able to compute this object, uh, but it's not so. It's not uh, possible, right? You can do it in some two-dimensional examples, but in general, it's very difficult. Nevertheless, even though we can't compute it, uh, we can analyze it by formal uh, uh, arguments uh, sufficiently uh, to the point that we will be able to identify uh, these modes B in the bulk with the Fourier modes of the field O on the boundary. So <clears throat> let me explain how th that this is done. So, um, so even though we cannot calculate this two-point function, uh, there is a, an exact property that it satisfies, which is called the KMS condition, which is a statement that if you take uh, one of the two arguments and you analytically continue it in imaginary time, and if you, uh, first of all, th there's a statement that it is possible to do that in one, in, uh, if you, you can add here a, a small negative imaginary part to this guy, and in particular you can push that imaginary part all the way uh, to the point of beta, and then uh, the statement is that this correlator, let me, uh, this correlator, uh, if we analytically continue, um, sorry, let me see how to write it. Um, let me just write it here. So this is telling us that these correlators are almost periodic up to an interchange of the order of the argument of the two operators inside the trace. And this is an exact statement. So it holds even though the theory is strongly coupled, right? Now, uh, how do we proceed? We consider now, we, we will try to identify the modes B from the point of view of the boundary. And to do that, uh, we consider the Fourier modes of this field O. So we take the operator O on the boundary and we expand it in Fourier modes on the sphere. Now, this is what, uh, the definition of this frequent of these modes o, uh, o omega L M. Um, let me emphasize that uh, there is no dispersion relation. So omega L and M are independent because this is not a free field on the boundary. It's an interacting, it's a composite operator. So you have to integrate over all frequencies. And um, then what we want to basically argue is that these B's in the bulk can be identified with these O's on the boundary. Uh, but let me uh, show how we can get, uh, for, for example, this statement that is most thermally occupied. Let me prove that statement from the point of view of the boundary. <clears throat> First of all, let me introduce the two-point function of these guys. So, again, I drop the indices L and M because they're not very relevant for the discussion. I define G of omega to be the two-point function of O omega dagger O omega. And then uh, G, uh, in this notation, if I take omega to minus omega, it's equivalent to taking a dagger, right? So G of minus omega is equal, is, is equal to this guy. And then the KMS condition which I introduced there implies that we have the following exact property, that G of minus omega is e to the beta omega 
g omega. Okay. Now, the next statement is that from the fact that this correlator factorizes, we can argue that uh, if you consider the commutator of two of these operators, so to the extent that you can trust large end factorization, you can show that inside correlators, this commutator be behaves like a C number. So it's some constant times the identity, right? This follows from large end factorization. Now, we can calculate this constant by taking the expectation value of this, of this object. Uh, so we take the thermal expectation value of both sides, and we find that this constant C is given by um, G of minus omega. This is one ordering. Uh, minus g of omega. And then using the KMS condition, we can combine this into uh, e to the beta omega um, minus 1 times g of omega. So we evaluated this constant c. And uh, so this allows us now to uh, rescale these operators. right? So we rescale them in order to get operators which obey canonical commutation relations. So I, I introduce an O hat of omega, which is O of omega divided by the square root of this object. And now it's guaranteed that this O hat obeys canonical commutation relations. I mean, they obey the usual ladder algebra for a harmonic oscillator. So the proposal then is that this B in the bulk is identified with this O hat, which is proportional to the Fourier mode of the boundary operator O. Let me now demonstrate this property. Uh, it just follows, it's just one line. Uh, let's calculate the occupation level of this O hat. So this is equal to uh, O dagger O divided by the square of this uh, factor, G of omega e to the beta omega minus one. And the numerator by definition is G of omega so this guy here is g of omega, which precisely cancels part of the denominator, not all of it, right? And you're left with a thermal occupation level. OK, so we found that these modes uh, on the boundary O hat uh, have the same algebra as the mode B in the bulk. So this allows us to uh, write down an operator in the conformal field theory uh, as follows, we take this equation that we derived in the bulk and we simply replace these modes here by O hat. So now this is a CFT operator, right? These are CFT operators, which means this guy is a CFT operator. And we have constructed an operator of the conformal field theory uh, with a property that at large n its correlation functions will reproduce the correlation functions of uh, the, sc the scalar fields that you would calculate in the bulk using the computation hogging. So this object, uh, even though it seems to depend on uh, the radial coordinate, it is actually an operator in the CFT. Because if you look on the right hand side, these are CFT operators. And the dependence on R is simply uh, inside the smearing function that you use to multiply these CFT operators. So this, the claim is that this object uh, uh, has, uh, um, so this object uh, respects causality from the point of view of, AD, of uh, this background, meaning that if you take two points in this background which are space-like separated, and if you calculate the commutator between two of these phi's corresponding to these two points, on the CFT, you will find that the commutator is zero, as large as n. So it seems that we can uh, re re reproduce uh, the causal structure of the space time at large n from, from the boundary. This is not satisfactory for several reasons that we can discuss uh, later, but uh, it's a starting point for reconstructing the bulk from the point of view of the boundary. It's just a starting point, right? 
And we, want to see, we will see later that even this basic starting point becomes very difficult once you take this point and you try to push it behind the horizon. Okay, are there any questions about this, uh, this construction here? So the claim is that uh, this is the way that we can describe the space-time outside the horizon of the black hole from the point of view of the CFT. You take the CFT operator, you calculate correlators between many of these guys, and they will reproduce uh, what you would calculate from the point of view of gravity. Yeah. You must know the details of the geometry in order to calculate the omega. So by CFT, it's so not a pure CFT operator. You can. Well, I argue somewhere that I, I think I raised it that. Uh, based on the arguments that we discussed yesterday, if you, even if you take a pure state in the CFT, at large n, these correlators will be almost the same as the thermal correlators, right? That we, tr we tried to prove yesterday, which means that uh, for the purpose of computing these correlators at a, let's say, coarse grain level, where you don't want the exact correlator, but you want the larger limit of the correlator, this construction will work both in pure states and in the thermal ensemble. Yeah. Well, this is a one way to to start thinking about bulk reconstruction. I mean, there are many open questions regarding bulk, bulk reconstruction, which uh, are relevant even for empty ADS before you consider black before you even consider a black hole. Just take empty ADS. If you try to reconstruct the bulk from the boundary, it's a, it's a difficult open problem, right? Now, uh, we have an additional difficulty, which is that we have a black hole here. And as we will see, when you try to push it, the point behind the horizon, there are new subtleties which arise, which are not relevant for bulk reconstruction in general. So I don't want to, I mean, I cannot answer the full question because we don't yet understand bulk reconstruction. I want to concentrate on the difficulties which specifically have to do with a black hole. Well, I mean, um, you, you can sort of prove it uh, at the level of rigor that I have like uh, outlined here. I mean, uh, which dictionary are you talking about? The, 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 the you mean the one I wrote there somewhere? Yeah. Well, uh, this is consistent with that. Meaning, if you take this operator and you take the limit r goes to infinity, it will reproduce uh, the boundary operator. <laughs> Uh, the CFT does not live uh, on the boundary, right? The, the CFT it does not live in ADS. It's a completely different theory, right? In some sense, you can think of the UV of the CFT as corresponding to excitations near the boundary of ADS, but uh, it's not that it lives there, right? Yeah. Um, almost, yeah. I will ask at the end. Okay. Uh, well, um, all right. So t we explained how we can describe the region behind, uh, in front of the horizon, and uh, well, tomorrow I will um, I will explain uh, what are the new uh, difficulties that we encounter when we take this point and we try to uh, continue analytically to, to extend to extend behind the horizon. So uh, just to give you an idea already now, the point is that when you, we take this point and we, we push it behind the horizon, we will need to uh, identify the new set of modes, the thing that we called C earlier, there, right, these C guys, which will be necessary in order to have a smooth infall for somebody who is falling into this black hole. And then the, the question I will discuss tomorrow is, is there a way to represent this mode C in the CFT? We already found a way, I mean, this was not, it was a kind of basic construction, but we, we know how to represent the most B in the core formal field theory. To describe, to, to, to address these questions and to describe what happens to the informing observer, we also need to, uh, uh, to identify this mode C. And as I will explain later, there are many difficulties, in, uh, even in principle, in identifying this mode C on the point of, from the point of view of the boundary. 
So in particular, I will present some arguments. Uh, we suggest that it is in principle impossible to find this object C on the boundary, which would imply that this big black horse in ADS have a singular horizon. And then I will try to uh, discuss possibilities of avoiding those arguments. Yeah, because, I mean, if you break, uh, right, so the discussion we had earlier was we had this problem with the monogamy of entanglement, right? That was a problem, right? Yeah. Now, one possibility was that you need to break the entanglement between B and A, right? Yeah. That would lead to unitarity loss. So that is not, that's excluded in ADCFT because the boundary theory is unitary. So then the question becomes, what about the entanglement between B and C? Do we have the correct entanglement between B and C? So B and C are small systems, right? They're just uh, modes of the quantum field. They're not complicated systems, they're just simple modes. So you can compute, you can uh, determine the quantum state between B and C by considering low point functions of the field in that region. So for example, two point functions, three point functions, etc. Yeah. Uh, is your concern about uh, how, how we go to higher point functions? Uh, no, no, no. Oh. Uh, Reconstruction. Uh, you mentioned the uh, kind of uh, the information paradox in terms of the two-point function ideas that uh, if we can oh, yeah. two-point function and it decays and uh, it contradicts unitarity. But uh, yeah, from this kind of reconstruction, I understand that we can have a look at the uh, monogamy problem. But I don't understand how this is helpful for the uh, resolution of the decay. Of the two -point oh, I'm sorry. That's completely unrelated. I mean, uh, this, this the thing we're trying to do now is not uh, related to trying to understand the late time behavior of the two-point function. So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that thing that I mentioned was uh, sort of an analog of the information paradox in ADSFT from the point of view of what, what happens uh, from the boundary, let's say. You, you never talk, in that formulation of the paradox with a decay, I didn't have to talk about the interior of the black hole, right? It was just a statement about the decay of the correlator that you can detect, measure at the boundary. So that I just mentioned in order to, uh, well, just for completeness, it has nothing to do with the discussion now, which is about the horizon of the black hole. But uh, these two problems should somehow be related still on the sun. No, because for example, if you have a firewall, uh, then uh, the two point function will, uh, will not decay to zero, right? It will just oscillate. Yeah, I so, I mean, any scenario which is unitary will reproduce this two-point function that does not decay, right? But uh, there are many different possibilities. It could be that there's a fastball or a firewall or, or the horizon is smooth. And we want to distinguish between those. Well, just to continue this question, I understand that you have problems to uh, check the entanglement between the B and the C modes because of the problems with the C modes in particular. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the um, ADS-CFT story, can you check explicitly that SAB is smaller than SA? Uh, you mean for an evaporating black hole? Yes. No, no. I mean, uh, because uh, we don't have techni technical control in that situation, right? Also, um, um, oh, sorry, just let me think for a second. You mean as a matter of principle or, or, or in some specific model? Uh, in a specific model. As a matter of principle, I understand it has yeah. to be because of unitarity. Yes, that's right. But uh, in a specific situation, it would be, I think, good to see it in a specific situation. Yeah, I'm not aware of any, anybody having done this computation in some uh, semi-realistic uh, example in ADCFT. I mean, you can do it with, uh, let's say, spin chains and this kind of stuff, but I guess you want to do it in a theory which has a gravity dual, right? right. Or, Um, no, 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 I mean, if you're talking about the bulk computation, then this, it has not been done. 